Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Journal Live. Tonight, local journalism's changing landscape, nonprofits, for profits, and what it means for communities and democracy. And now, here is your host, Chris Green. One of the things that people that learn in Kansas Leadership Center training programs is how to wrestle with something called adaptive challenges. And these are problems that defy easy solutions and they require things like experimentation and learning to address. Uh, the topic of our discussion tonight is a textbook adaptive challenge, sustaining the news coverage vital for communities to thrive in a changing and challenging landscape. Uh, in the last year, two very different nonprofit organizations dedicated to news coverage have launched in Kansas. Uh, that's part of a national movement that's found success elsewhere to really reinvigorate coverage of our communities. In the meantime, for-profit organizations like Kansas newspapers continue to play a critical role in delivering local news despite the pandemic, making their financial challenges much worse. They're, they're increasingly seeking out new and creative ways to generate revenue and ensure that they can continue to serve their communities. And as if to, you know, sort of underscore uh, some of the challenges that we're seeing in the landscape, I just read a story in the Kansas City Star about a newspaper in Kansas City that published a blank front page in order to uh, really energize readers around the fact that they need their support. And so this is a really interesting time of both challenge and hope. And today we have uh, five panelists here to help us understand this, what's going on and what uh, news consumers can, can do and think about their role in terms of you know, supporting and sustaining the coverage of local news in their communities. Uh, joining me tonight is Kelsey Ryan, founder and publisher of The Beacon, a nonprofit news organization that launched in Kansas City this past year and is now expanding into Wichita. Also joining me is Joey Young, the majority owner of Kansas Publishing Ventures, who is also the president of the Kansas Press Association, which represents newspapers. Uh, Benita Gooch, editor-in-chief of the Community Voice, is also here, as is Jonathan Keeling, the chief network officer for the Institute for Nonprofit News, and Joel Mathis, a journal correspondent who uh, has covered uh, the challenges facing local news coverage for several years for our uh, magazine, The Journal, and is uh, wrote an article for this past edition about nonprofit uh, journalism as a solution to some of the challenges facing our news industry. Uh, and that's one of the places that we want to start today is the growth of nonprofit journalism in Kansas. Uh, just a, a couple, uh, just about two years ago, Kelsey, you and I were sitting in the auditorium at the Kansas Leadership Center talking about the beacon as an idea. And now here we're on in a different setting uh, online and the beacon is no longer an idea. It's a real thing and it's growing. So tell me what's happening with the beacon. Uh, what's, what's coming up next and where's it going? Yeah, yeah, so, so you're exactly right. Uh, this has gone from basically a, a PowerPoint to a, a newsroom uh, within uh, 12 months, which is terribly exciting. Um, and you know, we launched early with the with the pandemic about three months, um, and we launched with a virtual, like you know, in a virtual setting. Uh, so with newsletter um, instead of our full blown website being ready. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, you know, we had um, done a lot of community engagement work uh, for the months prior to the pandemic and our early launch. And you know, originally the idea for the beacon was, you know. With my background as an investigative reporter, let's create a ProPublica for the Midwest. Um, and then pretty quickly, when we were doing these, you know, audience engagement sessions, realized that you know that's that's not um, necessarily all that people want. Um, people want to know what else is going on in their community. They want kind of the daily uh, the news cycle, but they also want context and they want it to get beyond kind of a he said she said um, kind of editorial stance. They also overwhelmingly told us they did not want opinion pieces. <laughs> so um, we actually listened to what people told us and during these community listening sessions and then baked that into the organization as, as we've grown. Uh, what's, what's happening with us now is, you know, we just celebrated our one year publishing anniversary. We have two full-time reporters, two part-time folks who help with social media and marketing. 
We have a full-time audience development manager who continues to do that community listening work. Uh, I do a little bit of uh, every, everything uh, at the moment. And uh, we have more than 20 freelance journalists, um, basically across the region, uh, who are photographers and reporters who help us write on our core uh, beats or area topics that we, that we report on. What's happening next is very big. Uh, we, we've been really fortunate um, to get some significant uh, national funding lined up. And it's kind of a, a trifold or a trifecta of, of funding that we're hoping will leverage more local support as well. Uh, we've been selected as grantees for the American Journalism Project and uh, their support is helping fund our business side operations. So they don't fund editorial, they don't fund the journalism, but they give us a mechanism to create a sustainable news business. Um, and it's a couple of years of support, which is really exciting. It gives us the runway to start to build out um, additional revenue streams and to become sustainable. So that is one really, really big thing that's happening for us right now. Uh, another really big thing is the Wichita Community Foundation um, is interested and has you know, said that they want us to start a Wichita newsroom. And so we are currently hiring for three reporters and an editor to start a Wichita newsroom this summer. It is a distinct newsroom. It is not just doing the same kind of coverage that Kansas City is. I'm originally from Wichita. So I definitely, or that area, so I definitely understand <laughs> the, the need to create, um, you know, something that is editorially, um, you know, original to that area and authentic to that, to that area. Um, and then the third thing is, you know, we're getting support from Report for America, uh, which is a service uh, nonprofit that helps fund uh, a portion of the reporter's salaries. Um, and we're adding more reporting power to Kansas City launching the Wichita newsroom with some Report for America folks, I think we may be the largest or one of the largest um, number of Report for America core members um, this year out of like over 200 newsrooms across the United States. So kind of a lot of things happening, a lot of balls in the air, but um, I'm really excited and, and mostly, you know, just really, really grateful that we have this opportunity and it's a very unique um, opportunity for, for Kansas and the Midwest. Uh, that's a lot to to fit in one answer. Um, uh, like, what has it been like uh, to start a site during the pandemic, and what's been exciting for you, and what's been challenging for you? What's what are the the barriers you're seeing? Oh goodness, uh, where to begin? With that um, well, most of our staff has actually never met in person. Uh, we're all in Kansas City. I've met several of them before the pandemic, um, but we're actually. We're really, um, we're really excited. Um, all of us got our first shots just by happenstance last week. And so we expect that we'll be able to actually meet in person for the first time in May once our immunization is, is complete. Um, so that's something that's bringing us a lot of, of joy right now um, on staff. Um, so that is a challenge, right? And in building an intentional newsroom culture in a completely remote uh, environment where your staff is going through a pandemic while reporting on it. Um, this is, you know, um, and I, you know, I hate to use the word unprecedented, but it's an unprecedented time. And so um, that has been a challenge just from a management and newsroom culture perspective. But we've been, you know, trying to work through that and being very intentional about creating, um, you know, a space where people feel valued and we're also, we can keep our mission, you know, first and foremost. Um, the other challenge, of course, is around community engagement. We had initially an, an imagined a launch that was very much about in-person events, and that clearly didn't happen. Um, so we had to pivot like everybody else and to, you know, focus more on virtual events. Um, and because of that uh, pivot, we did notice a shift in audience. Before the pandemic, a lot of the folks that were engaging with us were from more diverse communities. And after when we had to switch to virtual, we noticed that the diversity of the audience diminished. Um, so we are really eager for in-person to happen again. We're being more intentional and proactive about our outreach to audience and getting information from folks and making sure that they're engaging with us and that we're not just serving you know, one segment of the population. So uh, I think that speaks a lot to internet access and a lot of equity issues that already were an issue for 
everyone, but have been exacerbated by technology and the pandemic. And as a digital only publication, we can't ignore that. We have to you know, face that and, and find solutions um, around that um, to serve our broader mission as a, you know, a, a journalism entity. We can't just ignore the fact that some people don't have access to internet. So um, that has been a challenge and something we've actually written quite a bit about too is um, digital uh, inequities um, and the digital divide during the pandemic. So one of the things that I think is really interesting about uh, what the Beacon is trying to do and what, uh, what what your focus is and what your funders focus is, is a notion of sustainability. Like you're not just trying to provide really great local news coverage. You're trying to figure out a way that this can grow on into the future and serve more and more people and, uh, you know, s sustain local news for, for a long period of time. And which is really interesting considering all the financial challenges that we see right now. So I started out this by talking about how this is kind of a, a messy, uncertain situation where we're sort of learning how to fund things. And I'm sort of wondering how that lands with you. Does that feel right? Or do you really feel like you have the roadmap you need to follow to really uh, get news coverage where it needs to go sustainability wise? So I think the first thing is it's really important to be nimble and to not put all of your eggs in one basket uh, like like traditional newspapers did for so long. And so, um, you know, I've talked a little bit about this too. You know, my my dad lost his business in the recession in which uh, and he didn't diversify his clients away from aviation. And that is just like time and time again, something that we hear about, you know, diversifying revenue, diversifying revenue, like that has been ingrained in, in my brain from both that personal experience, but also, you know, working in, in newspapers. So, um, you know, that is, I think, something that we have to be aware of as we're building something new is that we have to think strategically about how can we have as much diversified revenue as possible as we build this thing. So um, that has been a kind of an underlying thing for me this whole time. But, you know, I, I think there are so many examples of folks who are doing this and making it work. And, um, and you know, I'm not just a fan of nonprofits. I definitely like folks like Joey and, and others like are, are, are proof that, you know, hyper local for profit can work as well. So to me, it's not so much about, you know, is it a nonprofit or for profit? It's about the business model that's behind it and the sustainability behind it. And do you have different streams of revenue? Do you have reader revenue? Do you have philanthropy? Do you have major gifts, corporate sponsorships? You know, the list goes on and on. So um, yeah, it's really not like you have to pick one or the other, but there are so many different examples of folks who are making it work with different business models and different tax statuses essentially. Um, so I'm, I'm really optimistic because there are folks that are trailblazing this and you can see it and you can learn from them and we can all learn from each other. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, so uh, as, uh, you know, as, as Kelsey mentioned, like nonprofit or for-profit media is still, you know, they're still uh, playing a cr critical role in providing uh, news coverage. And uh, tonight we have, uh, Joey Young and Benita Gooch with us. And I, I'm sort of wondering how things look in your world. Uh, oftentimes uh, we hear the doom and gloom stories uh, about the challenges newspapers are facing. Uh, what, what's, is it, does it really look like that? And, and how has this last year been for you and what's the outlook going forward? I'll let Joey go, he's the superstar. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think most of the doom and gloom stories um, are dictated by um, larger media outlets. And those are primarily owned by hedge funds and giant corporations. Um, they're mostly self-inflicted wounds in my opinion. Um, the, the truth is, is like what Kelsey said is that it's not about um, for-profit or non-profit being the future of journalism. It's, it's about sustainability and what works for each community. Um, for, for us, um, we launched a product in Newton um, to compete with a corporate-owned uh, hedge fund paper. Um, we're in year six of that project. And um, we have felt like we found sustainability. Um, we launched a for-profit newspaper. Um, but, you know, like Kelsey said, it was about, you know, making sure that we had reader revenue, 
um, that we got advertising. We launched, um, you know, a blues, birds and barbecue event where we held like a concert in down in a, in the park at Newton and sold tickets. And, um, you know, we, we've launched a promotional products, uh, you know, division in our company to are using our B2B, um, contacts, um, we're selling, you know, not just advertising, but, you know, you know, corporate t-shirts and all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, we, that's how we're diversifying revenue, um, how Kelsey diversifies revenue, um, will be up to her and, and how she does things. But like, largely, I believe that the, the, the doom and gloom stories are, are largely self, self-inflicted and due to, um, hedge funds trying to milk um, newspapers for all that they're worth rather than um, a sustainable profit margin like um, what we're looking to try to accomplish. Um, as far as the pandemic has gone, um, our business has suffered just like every other business in town has. Um, we're not unique um, to that. Advertising revenue is down. Subscription revenue is up, which is good. Um, but uh you know, we're, we're getting through just like um, the local restaurants are, the retail outlets, um, you know, it's, but we're trying to operate like a local business and not like a giant scaled national conglomerate. So I do feel like um, the community is rallied around us. And uh, I think if more, I feel like if more publications continue to work on their community and um, being hyper-local, um, you know, there wouldn't be as many doom and gloom stories about uh, the journalism industry. So that's my opinion. Thank you, Joey. Uh, and Benita, uh, you get a little joke in, in uh, Joel's story where you talk about how uh, your organization, the Community Voice, is the real nonprofit, uh, even though you're for profit. Uh, so, but, uh, but you're also uh, you know, sort of uh, both getting reader support and uh, working with organizations like Report for America and, and Facebook. And uh, tell me about how you're making things work. I, the, the, the tail end of that, the real nonprofit is we never make a profit. And so, you know, all these nonprofits are making lots of profit. And, you know, that's the thing, you know, for years, you know, we date back before both of these papers. We've been around 20 six years now and we're, we're what you call a traditional legacy paper we you know we were print and there was no such thing as an internet you know so i'm still one of those old schools and i remember being a kpa member and going to the early conventions joey and and nobody believed that internet stuff would ever work you know they're never going to take away from my print publications and we resisted i was part of the resistance we didn't want to start going to uh digital but um you know it, it's those I think papers who are, are making it too in the small ones, the smaller ones I think are, uh, but yet the big ones, the small ones, for those who are responding to the national trends and what's going on. And you know, there's some that just you know that's all we're gonna do. We're just gonna print a paper and that's it. And you know, that's all we're gonna do. But if you're not really getting in online and, and, and coming, you know, we've kind of gone to a digital first kind of approach with a lot of things. I mean, and we really, uh, I would really say that um, the pandemic was kind of good for us. It was kind of a kick in the rear end. You know, it just was kind of like, you can't sit around and we're bi-weekly and just think you can put something on a paper every two weeks. People wanted news fast and constantly and there was so much news to give them. We had to start just speeding up our whole process and so that was part of the change and the people responded. I mean, you know, I think almost everybody will tell you their page views and their readership went up during the pandemic. Now, yep, the revenue went down because the advertisers didn't. But it, but um, from there, we, you know, we just started making a lot of more changes. And we've been lucky enough, even though we're a non, we're a for-profit to get some grants. And I know I have a staff person and we started getting a few grants and she was like, wow, isn't that, that great? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, she made it think like that was something that happened all the time. I said, no, I've been in this business 20 something years. I've never had anybody want to give us any money. I mean, we've had to fight for everything we had. And now there's some people around who want to give you some money, but or, or some, some, some grants and some things that we can take, up, uh, take advantage of. But um, we're still 
a challenge is there are still organizations like the Wichita Community Foundation who won't give to us because they set up their policies based on they only fund nonprofits. So there, so the, the door is shut to us for a lot of grants. I would, that was always my thought. Oh, we, we can't get any money. We're, we're not a nonprofit. And a few people who wanted to see journalism survive have uh, come up with some grants and things. We're Report for America. We have two of them. That was probably the first thing we've gotten uh, was uh, we had one from last year and we're, we're getting one more for this year. But uh, you're right, We just like everybody else, we got busy, we got creative, we had to diversify. I mean, 95% or whatever we had, we were free paper, was advertising. So you know we were really hurting when uh, the pandemic came. So we got creative, we started doing, we started a membership campaign uh, where people could become members and help, help us. And a lot of people stepped up and we were really serious about a membership campaign. Um, and then, uh, and at one other point, we actually, before this, we started a ticketing site where we could sell like a, do like an Eventbrite or something like that. And well, that kind of went down when there were no events to ticket, <laughs> but we were already thinking, how could we be creative in, in, in our approach? But now we're also starting to look more towards a approach that's just not advertising also, but sponsorships. Like we uh, get support around writing projects versus you support just buy an ad in, in our paper. And that's kind of works for the kind of advertising that we were getting. But now instead of saying, just give it to us for this one special section, to help support a series of articles that we're writing in, in, on different topics. And so that's going over well. And um, so it it's, hasn't been a bad year. We're, we're just gonna keep being, as she said, uh, nimble, agile, however, and keep trying creative things. As soon as events come back, we'll probably bring our site back up. We'll be doing some events. Uh, it's going to be good. We're not. We're being. We're fairly optimistic. I mean, we're not. We're not doing the backstroke, you know. But we're floating a little bit slowly down the stream or up the stream, maybe. You know, it's 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 not so bad, but it is not. It it's we're we're not getting rich yet, but we're not going under. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to hear, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, the cloud of the pandemic will be. Uh, uh, provide some relief for, for all of us, and especially those of us in the news industry. Uh, I wanna turn for a second to uh, you know, Sam Smith, the communications director for the Kansas Leadership Center, and he's monitoring the comments on questions on Facebook. Uh, Sam, can you tell me uh, what we're hearing on Facebook and uh, if there's anything uh, uh, our panelists or I should respond to? Yeah, certainly, uh, Chris. There's um, been some support for some of the comments that our guests are making, observations that the, um, running a newspaper is much harder than it used to be. And same thing goes for other radio, uh, media outlets, but uh, support that the hedge fund papers have done much to hurt themselves, including cutting their products over and over to maintain unrealistically high profit margins. Um, at the same time, uh, the pressures on dailies are different than on weeklies and other specialty publications. That was a note that was made. And then um, there was one other here. And, and then the observation that with the pandemic, up to the information, up to the minute information is really important. In emergency situations, online journalism becomes the front line. And just kind of um, cheerleading for, we need to do whatever it takes to keep journalism alive. So support. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I want to turn now to uh, Joel Mathis, who I think has a question he wants to ask. Well, actually, it was more of a comment. I wanted to build off what uh, Bonita uh, said, because uh, we're talking about profit, nonprofit right now. But what you're, I think that's kind of increasingly a fuzzy distinction right now um, that you've seen a lot of papers, not just the community voice, increasingly rely on uh, nonprofit methods of trying to 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 raise funds so that they can be sustainable. Uh, the Wichita Eagle, the Kansas City Star, both now have reporters who are reported uh, funded by Report for America um, mm -hmm. on very specific beats. Uh, there is a new newest organization here in my hometown, Lawrence, Kansas, called the Lawrence Times, and they plan on being for profit, but they raised eleven thousand dollars from GoFundMe um, to get jump started. Uh, with a series of donations. And, and so and I, as I talked to some, some people for the story, uh, Ned Seaton over in, in Manhattan, um, he was certainly applying for, for, for grants. He hasn't gotten all the ones he wanted, but he also is very determined to stay in the for-profit sector. So 
I think what you're going to see going forward is maybe that it's not just one or the other, that there's kind of more of a hybrid approach going forward. Thank you, Joel. Uh, so now I'd like to turn to uh, Jonathan Keeling from the Institute for Nonprofit News. Uh, so can you tell us uh, about your organization and what it's about, who its members are, and like what is it yeah. that like binds these, binds these organizations together? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, so the Institute for Nonprofit News is a 12-year-old organization uh, comprised of 300 nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent publishers from coast to coast. Um, the Beacon, certainly one of our members and, and one I've been um, proud to be a supporter of uh, basically since their launch. Um, so, you know, we're, we're bound together, of course, by a common um, nonprofit status, but it goes way beyond that. Um, we're also, you know, we have a set of values around uh, editorial independence that we require all of our members to adopt. We also have strict standards around financial transparency that we require all of our members to adopt. And I think that's another really important um, thing to talk about right now, uh, because at, at the, 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 perhaps the worst news in journalism right now is there are a number of organizations that are masquerading as news organizations across the country. Um, and they take various forms and, and functions. Um, you know, I think, you know, I just saw that there's a bunch that are kind of operating under a religious banner, like Catholic publishers, um, but, you know, they're, they're much more politically active. There are sites that, you know, are, are literally run by political action committees that present themselves as journalism. Uh, and so that, that, I think, is a huge danger for journalism. And part of the way we try to combat that is by saying that, you know, if you want to be part of INN, if you want to be um, if you want to have us standing behind you, you have to spell out where your money's coming from. You know, you have to affirm that you don't get more than 15% of your funds from uh, anonymous funding. And you have to list all of your, your donors over $5,000. Uh, and so we've, you know, we are, we are bound by tax status, but it's so much more than that. You know, to Joel's and point and Benita's point about sort of the, um, the fuzziness or the hybridness of sort of the future of journalism, I think that's true. Um, and at INN, you know, we do support the nonprofit field, but not to the exclusion of other media. Um, you know, we think there's tons of room for for-profit, independent, community-minded publishers out there, and we work with them regularly. Um, but one thing that I do think distinguishes nonprofit publishers from for-profit is that nonprofit publishers really are, by their nature, community assets. Um, you know, the, the reason nonprofits exist is to be a benefit to their community. It's not to say that, you know, uh, for-profit publishers aren't serving their communities. The best for-profit journalism organizations absolutely do that. But by, by being nonprofit publishers, they exist to be community assets. They have a, they're run by a board of directors that represents their community. And I think, you know, to Kelsey's point, she started her effort with an intense community listening session. And she really shaped her launch based on that feedback. I mean, I saw the first version of the pitch deck and it, it, it varied quite a bit from what ended up launching. And I think that's a testament and a tribute to the community listening that, that she did. And that's, you know, Kelsey's fabulous and did fabulous work to launch, but she's not unique. Um, you know, in our field, there are a bunch of organizations that really are invested in serving their community and meeting them where they are. Uh, there's a great organization out of Michigan called Outlier Media that just published this uh, an, uh, an essay in the uh, Columbia Journalism Review uh, that said, you know, we can't be publishers that are first focused on solving or, or serving the intellectually curious. We have to serve people when they need access to information most. And I think some of what the Beacon did around um, helping people find um, COVID related resources at the beginning of the pandemic, their voting guide, all of those are really about meeting and serving a community when it needs information. Uh, rather than just sort of doing things that are interesting. I mean, that's absolutely part of journalism, but you have to first and foremost serve the information needs of your community. And we see a lot of the best nonprofit publishers doing that. And I think the best for-profit publishers can do that as well. Um, so, you know, I, I feel fortunate to work in a corner of the industry that's growing and growing rapidly. 
we added 80 members last year. We've added 20 so far this year and expect to add, you know, to add another 80 probably this year because it's a, uh, an area where growth is happening, where communities are, are being served, which, which is really exciting. Um, we have about 2,500 uh, journalists working in newsrooms uh, across the INN network. So it's not small, it's roughly on par with the reporting footprint of the NPR stations. Um, and then we, we have a goal of growing that network to uh, 22,000 journalists by 2030. Um, so it's not a random number, actually. When we set that goal back in 2018, 22,000 was roughly the number of journalists that had been shed by newspapers uh, from their peak to that date. Good news is our growth since 2018 puts us on track to be at 22,000 by 2030. Bad news is the hole gets bigger every single day and it's gonna require a whole lot more journalists. So, you know, we cheer and applaud for profit publishers that launch. We cheer and applaud for profit publishers that keep doing and keep serving their community. Um, we view nonprofit as a model and a good model that especially can provide really strong public interest reporting for communities. What is it that you think is, Jonathan, that, that makes the, a nonprofit approach so attractive right now? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's multifaceted. And number one, it's the diverse collection of revenue streams that you can tap into. It is the philanthropy. It's the reader revenue. It's the advertising sponsorship. It's events. Um, you know, so it, built in, it, it builds in diverse revenue streams. That's one. But then it, it gets back to that sort of community tie. You know, it really is about being in service of a community because you're a community asset. And, you know, there, there's no one but the community that benefits from your success. Um, you know, there's no one that's, that, that's out to make a huge profit or anything like that. And so in some ways, I think it's a reaction to where the journalism industry went. You know, I, I started my career working for a terrific Kansas-based family-owned publisher in the World Company in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and, you know, they, they tolerated profits that were probably far lower than what a, a hedge fund publisher would, would expect. And I think what we've seen is um, as, you know, hedge funds have expected those 15 and 20 and 25% profits, we saw journalism that got away from what it needed to be. And so in some ways, the... Uh, uh, rise in nonprofit publishers is a direct response to that. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Joel, in, in your story, uh, you address like many other things that Jonathan mentioned about uh, the, the benefits of the nonprofit model, but you also heard some concerns or reservations or other things. I, I guess there's a, you know, a joke that nothing is a panacea. Uh, so what's, uh, what, what did you hear about uh, maybe limitations that might be worth considering? Well, I think there are concerns when, because we're talking about a Kansas audience um, here right now, that there are concerns that uh, what is sustainable for uh, uh, communities at a Kansas City or Wichita level, or, you know, a lot of nonprofits are state or regional. The new nonprofit, the Kansas Reflector, has a mandate to cover state politics, um, that maybe that's not as sustainable at a, at a small town newspaper like the kind that perhaps Joey runs, um, and that, you know, when you, you, these bigger um, organizations have, they do, they have philanthropic, they have foundation funding, um, they have a much broader uh, base of people to uh, get memberships from, and so I think there's a sustainability from that standpoint. There are a lot of people at the smaller newspapers who are just a little bit wary of, of whether that is uh, possible at at a you know non-metropolitan area um, kind of level, and that's that's the the really the big thing I've heard. I you know I I, I I'm going to use this example again, but there's a new uh, news organization in this community uh, that started, and and I was kind of surprised because they decided not to go the nonprofit route, um, even though they don't expect to make a profit. And you know one of the things that uh, uh, the the founder said was she just wasn't sure you know she's trying to get journalism done she's not sure she's up to the task of fundraising or just even the complexities of nonprofit uh, uh, paperwork that you have to fill out and she wasn't sure she had the time and energy to do all those things in addition to just trying to get a, a business up and running um, so so that was a, another issue and the other thing I think I've I've heard a little bit is is um, 
you know, people in, in the smaller communities, I think, are still attached to their uh, their newspapers. Uh, certainly, the people who've been running newspapers are attached to to that old way of, or, or you know, arguably proven way of doing things. I know Joey very specifically <laughs> said to me when I was reporting on this story that he just feels like there are a lot of fads that come along, and he's he's a little hesitant to to jump on kind of those those bandwagons, and so. Uh, you know, I could let Joey speak to that, but those are three things that I've heard in terms of why people aren't necessarily going that way. Uh, and, and Jonathan, I think this is something you also addressed in your comments and that you also see uh, growth in rural areas in terms of nonprofit organizations. So there are these concerns here, but you're also seeing uh, yeah. things that it is possible. So, I mean, if, if a few things are going on, you know, number one, we're seeing some traditional newspaper publishers just, uh, especially as there may be an ownership transition, just take the plunge and convert from for-profit to non-profit, recognizing what Benita talked about, about being a, a not-profit, as we might call it, uh, you know, where, um, you know, there, there hasn't been a, a big return and just recognizing that the, the best course may be to, to do, to make a switch and just recognize reality uh, and call it what it is. So that's one thing. Um, and then another thing is we're seeing some really interesting models. Um, there's an organization in East Lansing, uh, Michigan, which, you know, that's that's not Newton or, um, you know, even Garden City or something like that, but it is a smaller community um, in Michigan. And, you know, they operate on a pro-am model where they've got a, a couple of full-time professional journalists, and then they have um, community volunteers um, who may cover a meeting or who may write a story and, you know, are, are doing it in addition to another job. And so we're seeing uh, models like that develop uh, and we're seeing, you know, but the, the reality is you don't need a ton of money to run a successful news publication, uh, you know, for especially for a small community. It's the same you know, the, the point that it's been made is you're, you're still, you're running a news business. And if you can run it uh, for profit, you probably can run it nonprofit. You just have to, to want to, you have to want to have that relationship with your community. Joel talked about uh, what the Lawrence Times is doing and um, I can't remember the founder's name, but I do follow her on Twitter. Uh, you know, she's, she's not wrong that there is additional paperwork and challenges that come with the nonprofit model. There's the, the application for nonprofit status and there's creating a board and managing a board of directors. Whereas if you can be a solo founder, there is something you know, that, that may make the startup process easier. Um, but I would just say, you know, I think um, there are benefits to choosing to, to go down this road um, and you have to weigh that uh, and decide ultimately what works. The other thing to mention is if you do want to go down the nonprofit road, there are avenues that you can pursue to make it easier. Um, one thing, and Kelsey, maybe you want to talk about this, but is fiscal sponsorship, which can allow you while you're going through the process of becoming a, a, a nonprofit uh, to borrow the nonprofit status of another organization, which can help accelerate the launch process. Yeah, we, we were fiscally sponsored. Um, most of last year uh, by the Kansas Newspaper Foundation, actually, um, and until we got our own 501c3. Um, and that was a great experience for us and it enabled us to start to tap into those grants that, you know, otherwise uh, maybe we wouldn't have had access to. Um, and I would add too that, you know, there I spent a lot of time when, you know, coming up with the idea for the beacon, you know, going back and forth between this for-profit, non-profit, what does this look like? And, you know, kind of what what the three things are that I landed on for why I went for nonprofit route were building something that's bigger than myself. Um, and so getting a board that had diverse stakeholders, community advisory board as well and building really a group of cheerleaders around an idea of an organization for the community good. So that was something that I really liked. Um, I also thought that having the ability to unlock grants through a 501c3 was something that would help with the revenue and the business side. Um, and then the transparency of the funding as a nonprofit is very important. And INN takes it even like, like Jonathan mentioned further, 
by having additional transparency for its members. Um, and then, you know, lastly, the mission. Centering back on the mission um, after, you know, years of myself working for hedge fund owned papers, um, this is something that gets lost a lot in the daily grind of larger newspapers that are for profit. And, and so, you know, wanting to recenter that as kind of the core of an organization. So there were lots of thoughts there. And I just wanted to add something going back to what Joel had mentioned about why some folks were maybe skeptical about nonprofits. I think that there's also um, not as nuanced of an understanding about the nonprofit model and that it's, it's you know, only grants or only one thing. But also, you know, there's a lot of money in places like Western Kansas. There's, there's a lot of major, you know, donors that live in different places around the region who, who would love to support journalism philanthropically. Um, and I think that, you know, what we're trying to do with like a, a regional network model in a nonprofit framework allows us to take advantage of some of the back end costs without sacrificing the editorial on the ground. And so, um, you know, there's actually a, a business strategy behind, you know, doing some of that. And then it enables you to really put your money into the editorial. Uh, on the ground because you're you're combining your business uh, team. So I think there's a lot more nuance there than some people kind of give nonprofits credit for. And um, you know, I just I think it can work in rural areas too. And there's there's creative ways to do it. Well, thank you for that. Uh, before uh, I'm going to give all of our panelists a last word uh, on uh, a question that I have, but I want to go back to Sam Smith, our communications director. Uh, Sam, I, I hear there are some specific questions uh, coming up on Facebook that our panelists might be able to answer. Yeah, there's a, there's a kind of a theme or a cluster around what makes a trustworthy process and I guess community-minded journalism. So what are the qualities that make for a good journalist uh, sourcing stories that the community needs to know about? Um, does uh, limiting access to subscribers through a paywall affect the mission of a publication? And then specific questions about how do you how do you run a story that people read without it being controversial? And a specific one about um, what is what does the industry think about the Sentinel, which covers Kansas and Missouri, I think, um, and concerns about um, bias occurring through uh, uh, funding through donors. That's a lot, but it's. It goes to this basic issue of how do you create a trustworthy process with your, with your readers? Yeah, do any of our panelists feel strongly or have some uh, uh, some strong views on what it really takes to be trustworthy in journalism right now? I think it's a lot about um, just being transparent, which newspapers and lots of media organizations have been doing for a really long time. Um, I don't necessarily think that news has gotten more bias um, over the years. Um, I think there's a lot more of opinion in people's heads. Um, I think people sit at home and watch Fox News and um, read um, opinion pieces online from uh, you know organizations that are funded by um, you know the Kansas Policy Institute. Speaking of uh, um, someone who has a website um, that looks like news that is completely slanted and has, but like, there's no uh, media competency anymore yeah. because, you know, it, and it's tough. It's, it's an evolving thing, you know, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, for a really long time, you had the three major networks and you had your local newspaper. And most people felt like you could, you could essentially trust those sources. Um, as we've gotten, um, you know, this technology boom, um, more and more people have access to creating websites and can create content and can do lots of stuff. And some of that, a lot of it is not for the good of the people. It is with essentially evil intentions. Um, um, you, you partner that with the boom of cable news and uh, um, you have a kind of a powder keg of opinion where a lot of people are taking in what they consider to be news, which is really just garbage um, commentary 
um, that isn't news at all. I think most news organizations, at least reputable ones, have always have have done a really good job of reporting and being transparent about the reporting. Um, I just think media competency is is not great amongst the public. And uh, that's something that's going to be a challenge for nonprofits and for profits going forward, period. So, well, and I think, Joey, that kind of brings me to my, my final question then that I think I'd like each of you to weigh in on if you're interested. But I'm wondering, like, if, if I'm concerned about local news coverage in my community, like, what would you recommend that I do about it? Uh, is, there, is there anything I can do? beyond just being a subscriber or donating, because obviously that's important. Like what, what, will, what will we have to do as individual news consumers to, you know, to muster the civic change that's needed for an informed society? Um, I mean, obviously, I mean, you brought up, I mean, you can, you know, you can donate to the, um, to the beacon, you can read reputable sources, you can subscribe to your local newspaper. Um, some of which are better than others. Um, there's lots of things that you can do, but like primarily I feel like if we could just teach the public the difference between news and opinion, one, and two, how to find reputable sources, no matter what their business model is and why they're reputable is those two things are really important. And uh, I don't think it's really that difficult. Um, simple Googling um, is, is, is uh, something that um, most people can, you know, can, can get behind. And it doesn't take a lot of looking into um, um, things like the, um, the Kansas Policy Institute's website to figure out what they're doing and why they're doing it and uh, that it's not really news. Um, even if it looks like news and it might have some former journalists working there, it's not really what people are looking for. And uh, I, I guess in, in short, that would be my opinion. What about you, Bonita? What, what do you see as important uh, for community members to do in terms of supporting local news coverage? Is there anything that'd be really helpful to you? Well, I, I think both of you hit on most of what I would have said. It's the same thing, you know, su support. <laughs> I mean, it's still, there's still bills to be paid, you know. And the thing I want to make as a, as a for profit, nonprofit kind of print versus online thing is, you know, the, our legacies in, in defense of some of the other papers, I mean, we, there, they were built on this old model and things have just changed so. And when you're a dinosaur, it's, you don't move real fast. And so, you know, from the standpoint of you have these big presses and you're printing, print is expensive and we still print, you know, maybe one thing you might, could, but you don't want to get rid of print because your model has been on print advertising. If I get rid of print, I can't make the money on, 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 on that you're making on your advertising online. So you got to keep your print. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a difficult problem for, especially as old legacy ones who are trying to tradition to transition. And then you still have the for-profit and you can't get the grants against the for-profits, I mean, the nonprofits who can get the grants. So it's a, it's, it's like over here and over here. Uh, although I know we said there's some coming in between, but there's a lot when, you, especially when you're dealing with some of our more traditional and older publications, um, you know, I guess, I mean, obviously we weren't uh, entrenched in a press, but can you imagine those people had these big presses and things and the expenses, but print is an expensive bill and I'm trying to compete against somebody who is strictly online and I can just put everything up in this big cloud and I never have any, hardly any expenses. So there's, um, I'm just saying those are some of the difference. I'm back to that nonprofit old and new and some of the differences, but yes, just, um, I would say read, tell others to read, talk us up. Uh, you know, again, we are that kind of model that we've had to go to those others. We, our paper was free. We're, we're printing out all this stuff and giving it away <laughs> for free. And so we need to move towards, uh, um, it, you know, some donations and some other ways of making money. And so, like I said, we did a really big, our biggest uh, membership drive we've ever done. Uh, and we're, it's a model we're going to continue to work on and can try to continue to grow uh, that model. But um, I, I would just say that um, I think 
we're, we're, we're just, it's just like blockbuster. Remember <laughs> what's a blockbuster? The world just changed. And I just think the, the industry is just changing so much. And, and, and what Jonathan's saying, I mean, it's just not going to look like it is today. It, 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 and it's, it's just constantly shifting. Either you figure out how to shift over here with it, but those who aren't are going to go, but it's not going to look the same 10 years from now or 20 years from now. Thank that's, you. That's my point. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Joel, uh, do you have any insights on what what people who want to support local news, what, what, should, what should they be thinking yeah. about? You know, I mean, everyone said it, but, you know, I'll underscore it. I mean, support the news you consume. Um, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about most mm -hmm. of INN's members is they do offer the bulk of their coverage for free to anyone who wants it. And I think that's really important that, so that we don't create a society where you have information haves and have nots. But that doesn't mean it doesn't cost money to produce. So, I, you know, I really appreciate and want to underscore that um, it's important to, to pay for either through membership or donation, the news you consume. But beyond that, so setting that aside, I think the next most important thing you can do is, is have a conversation with someone who may not get why news is important or have a conversation with someone who, you know, thinks that OAN, Newsmax, um, you know, some of the, the, the farthest extreme um, purveyors of information um, are news and help them understand um, where else they can get news or why those may not be the best places to get your news. Uh, because, you know, for us to really uh, change the way people get information, it's really going to require those one-on-one -on -one conversations. You know, we, we can, we can do, we can and should do the sort of media literacy campaigns that are talked about, but I really think um, individuals can have an impact on other individuals by, you know, it, by having those, those, sometimes hard conversations about why truth matters and why facts matter um, and just how um, good, meaningful democracy, good, meaningful journalism strengthens democracy. You know, there are all those studies out there about how the cost of local government goes up when you lose your local news source, how civic participation goes down when you lose your local news source. And I think the more people are talking about that with each other, the better off we'll all be. And Joel, you're uh, sort of observing uh, an experiment in your own community uh, related to news coverage. Uh, what's on your mind about supporting local journalism? Oh, uh, well, you know, Jonathan captured a lot of it, but I think, you know, we we're, we keep talking about how we need to start educating people more about media literacy. I think to some extent, um, we have people have to kind of want that as well. Um, and I think one of the reasons that some of these these outlets that we're talking about have done so well is because there is an audience for that. People like to be told things that comports with their worldview. And, and so what, what you see very often, what I've seen very often is when papers start to decline in their local communities, there's always a subset of people who's like, oh, you were biased anyway, so I'm kind of glad that you're, that you're suffering. And it, that, but, and they don't realize that they don't really know as much about what's going on at their city commission. Um, they don't even know um, the story I did two years ago about the decline of, of uh, newspapers in Kansas. They don't even know like when their Geranium Club is gonna is gonna meet now because that information's not there in one solid place like it used to be. Uh, and so they people want this kind of the slant, but they don't realize what they've lost. And so. We need to figure out how to, to, as Jonathan suggested, we need to let them know what they're losing and make them care about it. I'm not sure if we can make them care about it, but there, there are reasons they should, and we should be shouting that as, as often as we can. And we can't do it, I think we very often do it in the arrogant, you know, democracy dies without us. And that just seems very arrogant. And people hear that, and I think it's a turnoff for people. We have to give, make it more concrete than, you know, we are defenders of democracy. We've got to say, this is the information you're getting from us. And, and, and hopefully that's the thing that people want. I'm very intrigued by the fact that Kelsey uh, is not doing opinion at all at the beacon, but just delivering uh, reporting. And that's actually a very tough thing to do because reporting costs more than opinion. <laughs> and so that's why you get a lot more of opinion. 
And so that's that's uh, that's uh, not just a commitment um, philosophically. That's a commitment financially that she's made. Yeah, opinions are cheap, but facts are expensive. So Kelsey, mm -hmm. uh, we started with you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to have you have the last word here. What's on your mind relating to supporting local journalism, and what would you like our audience to think about uh, coming away from this? Yeah, yeah, but, but, but beyond the shameless plug, of course, to su subscribe to a newsletter and become a member or whatever, um, you know, there, it, it, it goes both ways. Um, you know, I think the, the days of you go out to the end of your driveway and there's a newspaper there and that's it and there's no further conversation. Um, I think that, that, that should be over. Um, and no matter whether or not you're still creating a print product or you're online only or not profit or for profit, media organizations have got to listen to their communities. And if we don't do that, we will not survive. Um, and so I think that that just hasn't happened um, for a lot, of, a lot of legacy media, not all of it, but for a lot of it for a long time. And that is why I think we're seeing a lot of folks, you know, move away from, from some of the larger traditional papers. We have to earn the trust. We cannot expect that we just get it. Uh, it is not something that you just get. Uh, you have to earn it. You have to be earning it every day. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, to kind of just kind of, you know, reiterate what Jonathan said, you know, if you believe in what your, your local folks are doing, you know, your, your for-profit or your nonprofit or whatever, you know, support them. And it, it doesn't have to be financially. It can be by telling a friend about, about you know, your, your local news organization. It can be by sending a nice note to the reporter, which trust me, they don't get very often. Um, and, and those little things have impact, right? And so I think at the end of the day, I think that my, my call to action, if you will, would just be to, to become engaged in your local news in some way, whatever is right, whatever's right for you. And um, that's going to look different for everybody. But I think at the same time as media, we have to um, make promises to you as well that it's, you know, it's a relationship and, and we're here to serve you and we have to earn your trust, not just um, expect it. So um, I think that's the part that I'm most excited about, about the future of journalism is that trying to reorient around community, trying to reorient around dialogue. And, uh, and, and, and making sure that trust is earned. Um, and so I think that will ensure, those are some of the key ingredients for ensuring that we'll have local news media for, for years to come, so. Well, thank you, Kelsey. That seems like a, a good way to end our program. Thank you to you, Kelsey, to Joy Young, to Benita Gooch, Jonathan Keeling, Joel Mathis. Uh, the, you know, the journal, uh, Kansas Leadership Center's print and digital magazine. Uh, we cover this issue. Uh, it's really awkward for media to write about media, but we feel like uh, covering this issue is important because it's really hard to have good civic leadership unless people also have access to really good civic information. And so the information environments in Kansas and how they're used, uh, that, that really translates to, to what happens in our civic culture. And so we'll be delighted to uh, follow uh, the progress of Kelsey and Joey and Benita. Uh, we'll certainly have more coverage from Joel and uh, um, I'm obviously pleased to be in touch with Jonathan and all the growth that's happening with the Institute for Nonprofit News. So we'll be seeing you going forward. Uh, next, this is, uh, we'll be uh, not having a journal live next month. Uh, next month we'll be launching uh, the next edition of the Journal of the Kansas Leadership Center uh, with a, uh, a Zoom conversation focused on uh, vaccine skepticism and what does it mean to have healthy, energizing conversations around that issue. So hopefully you'll join us on April 27th uh, for that uh, event and it should be a, a great discussion as well. Uh, thank you all and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Chris. Thanks everyone. Yeah.